Hello, friends, and welcome back to the ASMR Critique. My name is Joseph, and today we will be reading three short stories by Leo Tolstoy. I will be reading three questions, The Coffee House of Surat, and How Much Land Does a Man Need? I was originally going to read some other authors, but the very positive response to my first Tolstoy video prompted me to make this one first. Thank you so much to all of the new subscribers and everyone who commented and liked that video. I'm very pleasantly surprised at the positive response that it got. Without any further ado, let's get into it. Three Questions by Leo Tolstoy It once occurred to a certain king that if he always knew the right time to begin everything, if he knew who were the right people to listen to and whom to avoid, and, above all, if he always knew what was the most important thing to do, he would never fail in anything he might undertake. And this thought having occurred to him, he had it proclaimed throughout his kingdom that he would give a great reward to anyone who would teach him what was the right time for every action, and who were the most necessary people, and how he might know what was the most important thing to do. And learned men came to the king, but they all answered his questions differently. In reply to the first question, some said that to know the right time for every action, one must draw up in advance a table of days, months, and years, and must live strictly according to it. Only thus, said they, could everything be done at its proper time. Others declared that it was impossible to decide beforehand the right time for every action, but that, not letting oneself be absorbed in idle pastimes, one should always attend to all that was going on, and then do what was most needful. Others, again, said that however attentive the king might be to what was going on, it was impossible for one man to decide correctly the right time for every action, but that he should have a council of wise men who would help him to fix the proper time for everything. But then again, others said, there were some things which could not wait to be laid before a council but about which one had at once to decide whether to undertake them or not. But in order to decide that, one must know beforehand what was going to happen. It is only magicians who know that. And therefore, in order to know the right time for every action, one must consult magicians. Equally various were the answers to the second question. Some said, the people the king most needed were his counselors. Others, the priests. Others, the doctors, while some said the warriors were the most necessary. To the third question, as to what was the most important occupation, some replied that the most important thing in the world was science. Others said it was skill in warfare, and others, again, that it was religious worship. All the answers being different, the king agreed with none of them, and gave the reward to no one. But still wishing to find the right answers to his questions, he decided to consult a hermit, widely renowned for his wisdom. The hermit lived in a wood which he never quitted, and he received none but common folk. So the king put on simple clothes, and before reaching the hermit's cell, dismounted from his horse, and, leaving his bodyguard behind, went on alone. When the king approached, the hermit was digging the ground in front of his hut, seeing the king, he greeted him and went on digging. The hermit was frail and weak, and each time he stuck his spade into the ground and turned a little earth, he breathed heavily. The king went up to him and said, I have come to you, wise hermit, to ask you to answer three questions. How can I learn to do the right thing at the right time? Who are the people I most need? And to whom should I, therefore, pay more attention than to the rest? And... What affairs are the most important, and need my first attention? The hermit listened to the king, but answered nothing. He just spat on his hand and recommenced digging. You are tired, said the king. Let me take the spade and work a while for you. Thanks, said the hermit, and giving the spade to the king, he sat down on the ground. When he had dug two beds, the king stopped and repeated his questions. The hermit again gave no answer but rose, stretched out his hand for the spade, and said, Now, rest a while and let me work a bit. But the king did not give him the spade, and continued to dig. One hour passed, and another. The sun began to sink behind the trees, 
and the king at last stuck the spade into the ground and said, I came to you, wise man, for an answer to my questions. If you can give me none, tell me so, and I will return home. Here comes someone running, said the hermit. Let us see who it is. The king turned round and saw a bearded man come running out of the wood. The man held his hands pressed against his stomach, and blood was flowing from under them. When he reached the king, he fell fainting on the ground, moaning feebly. The king and the hermit unfastened the man's clothing. There was a large wound in his stomach. The king washed it as best he could and bandaged it with a handkerchief and with a towel the hermit had. But the blood would not stop flowing, and the king again and again removed the bandage soaked with warm blood and washed and rebandaged the wound. When at last the blood ceased flowing, the man revived and asked for something to drink. The king brought fresh water and gave it to him. Meanwhile, the sun had set and it had become cool. So the king, with the hermit's help, carried the wounded man into the hut and laid him on the bed. Lying on the bed, the man closed his eyes and was quiet. But the king was so tired with his walk and with the work he had done that he crouched down on the threshold and also fell asleep, so soundly that he slept all through the short summer night. When he awoke in the morning, it was long before he could remember where he was, or who was the strange bearded man lying on the bed and gazing intently at him with shining eyes. Forgive me, said the bearded man in a weak voice when he saw that the king was awake and was looking at him. I do not know you, and have nothing to forgive you for, said the king. You do not know me, but I know you. I am that enemy of yours who swore to revenge himself on you because you executed his brother and seized his property. I knew you had gone alone to see the hermit, and I resolved to kill you on your way back. But the day passed and you did not return, so I came out from my ambush to find you, and I came upon your bodyguard, and they recognized me and wounded me. I escaped from them but should have bled to death had you not dressed my wound. I wish to kill you, and you have saved my life. Now, if I live, and if you wish it, I will serve you as your most faithful slave, and will bid my sons to do the same. Forgive me. The king was very glad to have made peace with his enemy so easily, and to have gained him for a friend, and he not only forgave him, but said he would send his servants and his own physician to attend him and promised to restore his property. Having taken leave of the wounded man, the king went out into the porch and looked around for the hermit. Before going away, he wished once more to beg an answer to the questions he had put. The hermit was outside, on his knees, sowing seeds in the beds that had been dug the day before. The king approached him and said, For the last time, I pray you to answer my questions, wise man. You have already been answered, said the hermit, still crouching on his thin legs and looking up at the king who stood before him. How answered? What do you mean? asked the king. Do you not see, replied the hermit, if you had not pitied my weakness yesterday and had not dug those beds for me but had gone your way, that man would have attacked you and you would have repented of not having stayed with me. So the most important time was when you were digging the beds, and I was the most important man, and to do me good was your most important business. Afterwards, when that man ran to us, the most important time was when you were attending to him, for if you had not bound up his wounds, he would have died without having made peace with you. So he was the most important man, and what you did for him was your most important business. Remember then, there is only one time that is important. Now, it is the most important time because it is the only time when we have any power. The most necessary man is he with whom you are, for no man knows whether he will ever have dealings with anyone else. And the most important affair is to do him good, because for that purpose alone was man sent into this life. So that was Three Questions by Leo Tolstoy. I really enjoyed that story. It was short and sweet and to the point. I feel that it accomplished everything it needed to say. It's very true that now is really the only time that we have any power. We like to think that we have power over the future, but we really don't. And the past 
I mean, the past is the past. These are the kinds of stories I like. It's a happy ending. Everyone gets what they need. Because, you know, you can't always get what you want, but sometimes you get what you need. Next up, we have the coffee house of Surat. In the town of Surat, in India, was a coffee house where many travelers and foreigners from all parts of the world met and conversed. One day, a learned Persian theologian visited this coffee house. He was a man who had spent his life studying the nature of the deity and reading and writing books upon the subject. He had thought, read, and written so much about God that eventually he lost his wits, became quite confused, and ceased even to believe in the existence of a god. The Shah, hearing of this, had banished him from Persia. After having argued all his life about the first cause, this unfortunate theologian had ended by quite perplexing himself, and instead of understanding that he had lost his own reason, he began to think that there was no higher reason controlling the universe. This man had an African slave who followed him everywhere. When the theologian entered the coffee house, the slave remained outside, near the door, sitting on a stone in the glare of the sun, and driving away the flies that buzzed around him. Thurgeon, having settled down on a divan at the coffee house, when he had drunk it and the opium had begun to quicken the workings of his brain, he addressed his slave through the open door. Tell me, wretched slave, said he, do you think there is a god or not? Of course there is, said the slave, and immediately drew from under his girdle a small idol of wood. There, said he, that is the god who has guarded me from the day of my birth. Everyone in our country worships the fetish tree from the wood of which this god was made. This conversation between the theologian and his slave was listened to with surprise by the other guests in the coffee house. They were astonished at the master's question, and yet more so at the slave's reply. One of them, a Brahmin, on hearing the words spoken by the slave, turned to him and said, Miserable fool, is it possible you believe that God can be carried under a man's girdle? There is one God, Brahma and he is greater than the whole world, for he created it. Brahma is the one, the mighty god, and in his honor are built the temples on the Ganges' banks, where his true priests, the Brahmins, worship him. They know the true god, and none but they. A thousand score of years have passed, and yet through revolution after revolution, these priests have held their sway, because Brahma, the one true god, has protected them. So spoke the Brahmin, thinking to convince everyone. But a Jewish broker who was present replied to him, and he said, No, the temple of the true God is not in India. Neither does God protect the Brahmin caste. The true God is not the God of the Brahmins, but of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. None does he protect but his chosen people, the Israelites. From the commencement of the world, our nation has been beloved of him and ours alone. If we are now scattered over the whole earth, it is but to try us, for God has promised that he will one day gather his people together in Jerusalem. Then, with the temple of Jerusalem, the wonder of the ancient world restored to its splendor, shall Israel be established a ruler over all nations. So spoke the Jew and burst into tears. He wished to say more, but an Italian missionary who was there interrupted him. What you are saying is untrue, said he to the Jew. You attribute injustice to God. He cannot love your nation above the rest. Nay, rather, even if it be true that of old he favored the Israelites, it is now nineteen hundred years since they angered him and caused him to destroy their nation and scatter them over the earth, so that their faith makes no converts and has died out except here or there. God shows preference to no nation, but calls all who wish to be saved to the bosom of the Catholic Church of Rome, the one outside whose borders no salvation can be found. So spoke the Italian. But a Protestant minister, who happened to be present, growing pale, turned to the Catholic missionary and exclaimed, How can you say that salvation belongs to your religion? Those only will be saved who serve God according to the gospel, in spirit and in truth as bidden by the word of Christ. Then a Turk, an office holder in the custom house at Surat, who was sitting in the coffee house smoking a pipe, turned with an air of superiority to both the Christians. Your belief in your Roman religion is vain, said he. It was superseded twelve hundred years ago by the true faith. 
that of Mohammed. You cannot but observe how the true Mohammed faith continues to spread both in Europe and Asia, and even in the enlightened country of China. You say yourselves that God has rejected the Jews, and as proof, you quote the fact that the Jews are humiliated and their faith does not spread. Confess then the truth of Mohammedanism, for it is triumphant and spreads far and wide. None will be saved but the followers of Muhammad, God's latest prophet, and of them only the followers of Omar, and not of Ali, for the latter are false to the faith. To this, the Persian theologian, who was of the sect of Ali, wished to reply, but by this time a great dispute had arisen among all the strangers of different faiths and creeds present. There were Abyssinian Christians, Lamas from Tibet, Ismailians and fire worshippers. They all argued about the nature of God and how he should be worshipped. Each of them asserted that in his country alone was the true God, known and rightly worshipped. Everyone argued and shouted, except a Chinese man, a student of Confucius, who sat quietly in one corner of the coffee house, not joining the dispute. He sat there drinking tea and listening to what the others said, but did not speak himself. The Turk noticed him sitting there and appealed to him, saying, You can confirm what I say, my good Chinese man. You hold your peace, but if you spoke, I know you would uphold my opinion. Traitors from your country who come to me for assistance tell me that though many religions have been introduced into China, you Chinese consider Mohammedanism the best of all, and adopt it willingly. Confirm then, my words, and tell us your opinion of the true God and of his prophet. Yes, yes said the rest, turning to the Chinese man. Let us hear what you think on the subject. The Chinese man, the student of Confucius, closed his eyes and thought a while. Then he opened them again, and drawing his hands out of the wide sleeves of his garment and folding them on his breast, he spoke as follows, in a calm and quiet voice. Sirs, it seems to me that it is chiefly pride that prevents men agreeing with one another on matters of faith. If you care to listen to me, I will tell you a story which will explain this by an example. I came here from China on an English steamer which had been round the world. We stopped for fresh water and landed on the east coast of the island of Sumatra. It was midday, and some of us, having landed, sat in the shade of some coconut palms by the seashore, not far from a native village. We were a party of men of different nationalities. As we sat there, a blind man approached us. We learned afterwards that he had gone blind from gazing too long and too persistently at the sun, trying to find out what it is in order to seize its light. He strove a long time to accomplish this, constantly looking at the sun, but the only result was that his eyes were injured by its brightness and he became blind. Then he said to himself, The light of the sun is not a liquid, for if it were a liquid, it would be possible to pour it from one vessel into another, and it would be moved, like water, by the wind. Neither is it fire, for if it were fire, water would extinguish it. Neither is light a spirit, for it is seen by the eye, nor is it matter, for it cannot be moved. Therefore, as the light of the sun is neither liquid, nor fire, nor spirit, nor matter, it is... Nothing. So he argued, and as a result of always looking at the sun and always thinking about it, he lost both his sight and his reason. And when he went quite blind, he became fully convinced that the sun did not exist. With this blind man came a slave, who after placing his master in the shade of the coconut tree, picked up a coconut from the ground and began making it into a night light. He twisted a wick from the fiber of the coconut, squeezed oil from the nut in the shell, and soaked the wick in it. As the slave sat doing this, the blind man sighed and said to him, Well, slave, was I not right when I told you there is no sun? Do you not see how dark it is? Yet people say there is a sun. But if so, what is it? I do not know what the sun is, said the slave. That is no business of mine. But I know what light is. Here I have made a night light, by the help of which I can serve you and find anything I want in the hut. And the slave picked up the coconut shell, saying, This is my son. A lame man with crutches, who was sitting nearby, heard these words and laughed. You have evidently been blind all your life, said he to the blind man, not to know what the sun is. 
I will tell you what it is. The sun is a ball of fire, which rises every morning out of the sea and goes down again among the mountains of our island each evening. We have all seen this, and if you had had your eyesight, you too would have seen it. A fisherman, who had been listening to the conversation, said, It is plain enough that you have never been beyond your own island. If you were not lame, and if you had been out as I have in a fishing boat, you would know that the sun does not set among the mountains of our island, but as it rises from the ocean every morning, so it sets again in the sea every night. What I am telling you is true, for I see it every day with my own eyes. Then an Indian who was of our party interrupted him by saying, I am astonished that a reasonable man should talk such nonsense. How can a ball of fire possibly descend into the water and not be extinguished? The sun is not a ball of fire at all. It is the deity named Deva who rides forever in a chariot round the golden mountain, Meru. Sometimes the evil serpents Ragu and Ketu attack Deva and swallow him, and then the earth is dark. But our priests pray that the deity may be released, and then he is set free. Only such ignorant men as you, who have never been beyond their own island, can imagine that the sun shines for their country alone. Then the master of an Egyptian vessel, who was present, spoke in his turn. No, said he, you also are wrong. The sun is not a deity, and does not move only round India and its golden mountain. I have sailed much on the Black Sea and along the coasts of Arabia, and I have been to Madagascar and to the Philippines. The sun lights the whole earth, and not India alone. It does not circle round one mountain, but rises far in the east beyond the isles of Japan, and sets far, far away in the west beyond the islands of England. That is why the Japanese call their country Nippon, that is, the birth of the sun. I know this well, for I have myself seen much, and heard more from my grandfather, who sailed to the very ends of the sea. He would have gone on, but an English sailor from our ship interrupted him. There is no country, he said, where people know so much about the sun's movements as in England. The sun, as everyone in England knows, rises nowhere and sets nowhere. It is always moving round the earth. We can be sure of this, for we have just been round the world ourselves, and nowhere knocked up against the sun. Wherever we went, the sun showed itself in the morning and hid itself at night, just as it does here. And the Englishman took a stick and, drawing circles on the sand, tried to explain how the sun moves in the heavens and goes round the world. But he was unable to explain it clearly, and pointing to the ship's pilot said, This man knows more about it than I do. He can explain it properly. The pilot, who was an intelligent man, had listened in silence to the talk till he was asked to speak. Now everyone turned to him, and he said, You are all misleading one another, and are yourselves deceived. The sun does not go round the earth, but the earth goes round the sun, revolving as it goes and turning towards the sun in the course of each 24 hours. Not only Japan and the Philippines and Sumatra where we now are, but Africa and Europe and America and many lands besides. The sun does not shine for some one mountain or for some one island or for some one sea, nor even for one earth alone, but for other planets as well as our earth. If you would only look up at the heavens instead of at the ground beneath your own feet, you might all understand this, and would then no longer suppose that the sun shines for you, or for your country alone. Thus spoke the wise pilot, who had voyaged much about the world, and had gazed much upon the heavens above. So, on matters of faith, continued the Chinese man, the student of Confucius, it is pride that causes error and discord among men. As with the sun, so it is with God. Each man wants to have a special god of his own, or at least a special god for his native land. Each nation wishes to confine in its own temples him whom the whole world cannot contain. Can any temple compete with that which God himself has built to unite all men in one faith and one religion? All human temples are built on the model of this temple, which is God's own world. Every temple has its fonts, its vaulted roof, its lamps, its pictures or sculptures, its inscriptions, its books of the law, its offerings, its altars, and its priests. But in what temple is there such a font as the ocean, such a vault as that of the heavens, such lamps as the sun, moon, and stars, or any figures to be compared with living, loving, mutually helpful men? 
Where are there any records of God's goodness so easy to understand as the blessings which God has strewn abroad for man's happiness? Where is there any book of the law so clear to each man as that written in his heart? What sacrifices equal the self-denials which loving men and women make for each other? And what altar can be compared with the heart of a good man on which God himself accepts the sacrifice? The higher a man's conception of God, the better will he know him. And the better he knows God, the nearer he will draw to him, imitating his goodness, his mercy, and his love of man. Therefore, let him who sees the sun's whole light filling the world refrain from blaming or despising the superstitious man who in his own idol sees one ray of that same light. Let him not despise even the unbeliever who is blind and cannot see the sun at all. So spoke the Chinese man, the student of Confucius, and all who were present in the coffee house were silent and disputed no more as to whose faith was the best. That was the coffee house of Surat. I thought that was a pretty powerful story. That story reminded me a lot of something that Alan Watts once said about spiritual one-upsmanship. See, even in the most minute of ways, we're all trying to get one up over everyone in the most subtle and devious of ways without even knowing it. We want to justify ourselves, our way of thinking, our way of living, our way of looking at life and going about life. And that is a function of pride. And it's the kind of thing that is actually harmful to our growth spiritually, at least until we can recognize it and act on it. There's a lot of people out there who are very fearful of where the world is going. They are fearful of their fellow human beings, putting the blame on them for acts of ignorance. I feel that is counterproductive to distrust. He who does not trust will not be trusted. I feel it's almost better to put your trust in people and be disappointed than to harden yourself up and to be immovable like a stone. Tolstoy describes the Chinese man as a Confucianist, but he is also just as much a Taoist. Chinese philosophy is built on both Confucianism and Taoism. And it's pretty much impossible to separate them from the development of thought and philosophy in the Far East. Not just China, but in Korea and Japan too. Next we have, How much land does a man need? An elder sister came to visit her younger sister in the country. The elder was married to a tradesman in town, the younger to a peasant in the village. As the sisters sat over their tea talking, the elder began to boast of the advantages of town life, saying how comfortably they lived there, how well they dressed, what fine clothes her children wore, what good things they ate and drank, and how she went to the theater, promenades and entertainments. The younger sister was piqued, and in turn disparaged the life of a tradesman, and stood up for that of a peasant. I would not change my way of life for yours, said she, we may live roughly, but at least we are free from anxiety. You live in better style than we do, but though you often earn more than you need, you are very likely to lose all you have. You know the proverb, loss and gain are brothers twain. It often happens that people who are wealthy one day are begging their bread the next. Our way is safer. Though a peasant's life is not a fat one, it is a long one. We shall never grow rich, but we shall always have enough to eat. The elder sister said sneeringly, Enough? Yes, if you like to share with the pigs and the calves, what do you know of elegance or manners? However much your good man may slave, you will die as you are living, on a dung heap, and your children the same. Well, what of that? replied the younger. Of course our work is rough and coarse, but on the other hand it is sure, and we need not bow to anyone, but you, in your towns, are surrounded by temptations. Today all may be right, but tomorrow the evil one may tempt your husband with cards, wine, or woman, and all will go to ruin. Don't such things happen often enough? Pahom, the master of the house, was lying on top of the oven, and he listened to the woman's chatter. It is perfectly true, thought he, busy as we are from childhood tilling Mother Earth. We peasants have no time to let any nonsense settle in our heads. Our only trouble is that we haven't land enough. If I had plenty of land, I shouldn't fear the devil himself. The woman finished their tea, 
chatted a while about dress, and then cleared away the tea things and lay down to sleep. But the devil had been sitting behind the oven and had heard all that was said. He was pleased that the peasant's wife had led her husband into boasting, and that he had said that if he had plenty of land, he would not fear the devil himself. All right, thought the devil, we will have a tussle. I'll give you land enough, and by means of that land, I will get you into my power. Close to the village there lived a lady, a small landowner who had an estate of about 300 acres. She had always lived on good terms with the peasants, until she engaged as her steward an old soldier, who took to burdening the people with fines. However careful Pahom tried to be, it happened again and again that now a horse of his got among the lady's oats. Now a cow strayed into her garden, now his calves found their way into her meadows, and he always had to pay a fine. Pahom paid, and paid dearly. Pahom paid, but grumbled, and, going home in a temper, was rough with his family. All through that summer, Pahom had much trouble because of this steward, and he was even glad when winter came and the cattle had to be stabled. Though he grudged the fodder when they could no longer graze on the pasture land, at least he was free from anxiety about them. In the winter, the news got about that the lady was going to sell her land, and that the keeper of the inn on the high road was bargaining for it. When the peasants heard this, they were very much alarmed. Well, thought they, if the innkeeper gets the land, he will worry us with fines worse than the lady's steward. We all depend on that estate. So the peasants went on behalf of their commune, and asked the lady not to sell the land to the innkeeper, offering her a better price for it themselves. The lady agreed to let them have it. Then the peasants tried to arrange for the commune to buy the whole estate, so that it might be held by all in common. They met twice to discuss it, but could not settle the matter. The evil one sowed discord among them, and they could not agree. So they decided to buy the land individually, each according to his means. And the lady agreed to this plan, as she had to the other. Presently, Pahom heard that a neighbor of his was buying fifty acres, and that the lady had consented to accept one half in cash, and to wait a year for the other half. Pahom felt envious. Look at that, thought he. The land is all being sold, and I shall get none of it. So he spoke to his wife. Other people are buying, said he, and we must also buy twenty acres or so. Life is becoming impossible. That steward is simply crushing us with his fines. So they put their heads together and considered how they could manage to buy it. They had 100 rubles laid by. They sold a colt and one half of their bees, hired out one of their sons as a laborer, and took his wages in advance, borrowed the rest from a brother-in-law, and so scraped together half the purchase money. Having done this, Paham chose out a farm of 40 acres, some of it wooded, and went to the lady to bargain for it. They came to an agreement, and he shook hands with her upon it, and paid her a deposit in advance. Then they went to town and signed the deeds, he paying half the price down, and undertaking to pay the remainder within two years. So now Pahom had land of his own. He borrowed seed and sowed it on the land he had bought. The harvest was a good one, and within a year he had managed to pay off his debts, both to the lady and to his brother-in-law. So he became a landowner, plowing and sowing his own land, making hay on his own land, cutting his own trees, and feeding his cattle on his own pasture. When he went out to plow his fields, or to look at his growing corn, or at his grass meadows, his heart would fill with joy. The grass that grew, and the flowers that bloomed there, seemed to him unlike any that grew elsewhere. Formerly, when he had passed by that land, it had appeared the same as any other land, but now it seemed quite different. So Paham was well contented, and everything would have been right if the neighboring peasants would only not have trespassed on his cornfields and meadows. He appealed to them most civilly, but still they went on. Now the communal herdsmen would let the village cows stray into his meadows. Then horses from the night pasture would get among his corn. Paham turned them out again and again and forgave their owners, and for a long time he forbore from prosecuting anyone. But at last he lost patience and complained to the district court. He knew it was the peasants' want of land, and no evil intent on their part, that caused the trouble. But he thought, I cannot go on overlooking it, or they will destroy all I have. They must be taught a lesson. So he had them up, gave them one lesson, and then another, and two or three of the peasants were fined. After a time, Pahom's neighbors began to bear him a grudge for this, 
and would now and then let their cattle on his land on purpose. One peasant even got into Paham's wood at night and cut down five young lime trees for their bark. Paham, passing through the wood one day, noticed something white. He came nearer and saw the stripped trunks lying on the ground, and close by stood the stumps where the tree had been. Paham was furious. If he had only cut one tree here and there, it would have been bad enough, thought Paham. But the rascal has actually cut down a whole clump. If I could only find out who did this, I would pay him out. He racked his brains as to who it could be. Finally, he decided. It must be Simon. No one else could have done it. So he went to Simon's homestead to have a look around, but he found nothing and only had an angry scene. However, he now felt more certain than ever that Simon had done it, and he lodged a complaint. Simon was summoned. The case was tried and retried, and at the end of it all, Simon was acquitted, there being no evidence against him. Paham felt still more aggrieved and let his anger loose upon the elder and the judges. You let thieves grease your palms, said he. If you were honest folk yourselves, you would not let a thief go free. So Paham quarreled with the judges and with his neighbors. Threats to burn his building began to be uttered. So though Paham had more land, his place in the commune was much worse than before. About this time a rumor got about that many people were moving to new parts. There's no need for me to leave my land, thought Paham, but some of the others might leave our village, and then there would be more room for us. I would take over their land myself and make my estate a bit bigger. I could then live more at ease. As it is, I am still too cramped to be comfortable. One day Paham was sitting at home, when a peasant passing through the village happened to call in. He was allowed to stay the night, and supper was given him. Paham had a talk with his peasant and asked him where he came from. The stranger answered that he came from beyond the Volga, where he had been working. One word led to another, and the man went on to say that many people were settling in those parts. He told how some people from his village had settled there. They had joined the commune, and had had twenty-five acres per man granted them. The land was so good, he said, that the rye sown on it grew as high as a horse, and so thick that five cuts of a sickle made a sheaf. One peasant, he said, had brought nothing with him but his bare hands, and now he had six horses and two cows of his own. Paham's heart kindled with desire, he thought. Why should I suffer in this narrow hole, if one can live so well elsewhere? I will sell my land in my homestead here, and with the money I will start afresh over there and get everything new. In this crowded place, one is always having trouble, but I must first go and find out all about it myself. Towards summer, he got ready and started. He went down to the Volga on a steamer to Samara, then walked another 300 miles on foot, and at last reached the place. It was just as the stranger had said. The peasants had plenty of land. Every man had 25 acres of communal land given him for his use, and any one who had money could buy. Besides, at 50 cents an acre as much good freehold land as he wanted. Having found out all he wished to know, Paham returned home as autumn came on and began selling off his belongings. He sold his land at a profit, sold his homestead and all his cattle, and withdrew from membership of the commune. He only waited till the spring and then started with his family for the new settlement. As soon as Paham and his family arrived at their new abode, he applied for admission into the commune of a large village. He stood treat to the elders and obtained the necessary documents. Five shares of communal land were given him for his own and his son's use. That is to say, 125 acres, not all together but in different fields, besides the use of the communal pasture. Paham put up the buildings he needed and bought cattle. Of the communal land alone, he had three times as much as at his former home, and the land was good corn land. He was ten times better off than he had been. He had plenty of arable land and pasturage, and could keep as many head of cattle as he liked. At first, in the bustle of building and settling down, Paham was pleased with it all. But when he got used to it, he began to think that even here he had not enough land. The first year, he sowed wheat on his share of the communal land and had a good crop. He wanted to go on sowing wheat, but had not enough communal land for the purpose, and what he had already used was not available. For in those parts, wheat is only sown on virgin soil or on fallow land. It is sown for one or two years, and then the land lies fallow till it is again overgrown with prairie grass. 
There were many who wanted such land, and there was not enough for all, so that people quarreled about it. Those who were better off wanted it for growing wheat, and those who were poor wanted it to let to dealers, so that they might raise money to pay their taxes. Paham wanted to sow more wheat, so he rented land from a dealer for a year. He sowed much wheat and had a fine crop, but the land was too far from the village. The wheat had to be carted more than ten miles. After a time, Paham noticed that some peasant dealers were living on separate farms and were growing wealthy, and he thought, If I were to buy some freehold land and have a homestead on it, it would be a different thing altogether. Then it would be all nice and compact. The question of buying freehold land recurred to him again and again. He went on in the same way for three years, renting land and sowing wheat. The seasons turned out well and the crops were good, so that he began to lay money by. He might have gone on living contentedly, but he grew tired of having to rent other people's land every year and having to scramble for it. Wherever there was good land to be had, the peasants would rush for it and it was taken up at once, so that unless you were sharp about it, you got none. It happened in the third year that he and a dealer together rented a piece of pasture land from some peasants, and they had already plowed it up when there was some dispute, and the peasants went to law about it, and things fell out so that the labor was all lost. If it were my own land, thought Paham, I should be independent, and there would not be all this unpleasantness. So Paham began looking out for land which he could buy, and he came across a peasant who had bought 1,300 acres, but having got into difficulties, was willing to sell again, cheap. Paham bargained and haggled with him, and at last they settled the price at 1,500 rubles, part in cash and part to be paid later. They had all but clinched the matter, when a passing dealer happened to stop at Paham's house one day to get feed for his horse. He drank tea with Paham, and they had a talk. The dealer said that he was just returning from the land of the Bashkirs, far away, where he had bought 13,000 acres of land, all for a thousand rubles. Paham questioned him further, and the tradesman said, All one need do is to make friends with the chiefs. I gave away about 100 rubles worth of dressing gowns and carpets, besides a case of tea, and I gave wine to those who could drink it, and I got the land for less than two cents an acre. And he showed Paham the title deeds saying, The land lies near a river, and the whole prairie is virgin soil. Paham plied him with questions, and the tradesman said, There is more land there than you could cover if you walked a year, and it all belongs to the Bashkirs. They are as simple as sheep, and land can be got almost for nothing. There now, thought Paham, with my one thousand rubles, why should I get only thirteen hundred acres and saddle myself with a debt besides? If I take it out there, I can get more than ten times as much for the money. Paham inquired how to get to the place, and as soon as the tradesman had left him, he prepared to go there himself. He left his wife to look after the homestead, and started on his journey, taking his man with him. They stopped at a town on their way, and bought a case of tea, some wine, and other presents, as the tradesman had advised. On and on they went until they had gone more than three hundred miles, and on the seventh day, they came to a place where the Bashkirs had pitched their tents. It was all just as the tradesmen had said. The people lived on the steps, by a river, in felt-covered tents. They neither tilled the ground nor ate bread. Their cattle and horses grazed in herds on the step. The colts were tethered behind the tents, and the mares were driven to them twice a day. The mares were milked, and from the milk kumis was made. It was the woman who prepared kumis, and they also made cheese. As far as the men were concerned, drinking kumis and tea, eating mutton, and playing on their pipes was all they cared about. They were all stout and merry, and all the summer long, they never thought of doing any work. They were quite ignorant, and knew no Russian, but were good-natured enough. As soon as they saw Paham, they came out of their tents and gathered round their visitor. An interpreter was found, and Paham told them he had come about some land. The Bashkirs seemed very glad. They took Paham and led him into one of the best tents, where they made him sit on some down cushions placed on a carpet, while they sat around him. They gave him tea and kumis, and had a sheep killed, and gave him mutton to eat. Paham took presents out of his cart and distributed them among the Bashkirs, and divided amongst them the tea. The Bashkirs were delighted. They talked a great deal among themselves, 
and then told the interpreter to translate. They wish to tell you, said the interpreter, that they like you, and that it is our custom to do all we can to please a guest and to repay him for his gifts. You have given us presents. Now tell us which of the things we possess please you best, that we may present them to you. What pleases me best here, answered Pahom, is your land. Our land is crowded, and the soil is exhausted. But you have plenty of land, and it is good land. I never saw the like of it. The interpreter translated. The Bashkirs talked among themselves for a while. Pahom could not understand what they were saying, but saw that they were much amused, and that they shouted and laughed. Then they were silent and looked at Pahom while the interpreter said, They wish to tell me that in return for your presence, they will gladly give you as much land as you want. You have only to point it out with your hand, and it is yours. The Bashkirs talked again for a while and began to dispute. Pahom asked what they were disputing about, and the interpreter told him that some of them thought they ought to ask their chief about the land and not act in his absence, while others thought there was no need to wait for his return. While the Bashkirs were disputing, a man in a large fox fur cap appeared on the scene. They all became silent and rose to their feet. The interpreter said, This is our chief himself. Pahom immediately fetched the best dressing gown and five pounds of tea and offered these to the chief. The chief accepted them and seated himself in the place of honor. The Bashkirs at once began telling him something. The chief listened for a while, then made a sign with his head for them to be silent, and addressing himself to Pahom, said in Russian, Well, let it be so. Choose whatever piece of land you like. We have plenty of it. How can I take as much as I like? thought Pahom. I must get a deed to make it secure, or else they may say, It is yours, and afterwards may take it away again. Thank you for your kind words, he said aloud. You have much land, and I only want a little. But I should like to be sure which bit is mine. Could it not be measured and made over to me? Life and death are in God's hands. You good people give it to me, but your children might wish to take it away again. You are quite right, said the chief. We will make it over to you. I heard that a dealer had been here, continued Pahom, and that you gave him a little land too and sign title deeds to that effect. I should like to have it done in the same way. The chief understood. Yes, replied he. That can be done quite easily. We have a scribe, and we will go to town with you and have the deed properly sealed. And what will be the price? asked Pahom. Our price is always the same. One thousand rubles a day. Pahom did not understand. A day? What measure is that? How many acres would that be? We do not know how to reckon it out, said the chief. We sell it by the day. As much as you can go round on your feet in a day is yours, and the price is 1,000 rubles a day. Pahom was surprised. But in a day, you can get round a large tract of land, he said. The chief laughed. The chief laughed. Ha ha, it will all be yours, said he. But there is one condition. If you don't return on the same day to the spot whence you started, your money is lost. But how am I to mark the way that I have gone? Why, we shall go to any spot you like and stay there. You must start from that spot and make your round, taking a spade with you. Wherever you think necessary, make a mark. At every turning, dig a hole and pile up turf. Then afterwards we will go round with a plow from hole to hole. You may make as large a circuit as you please, but before the sun sets you must return to the place you started from. All the land you cover will be yours. Paham was delighted. It was decided to start early next morning. They talked a while, and after drinking some more kumis and eating some more mutton, they had tea again, and then the night came on. They gave Paham a feather bed to sleep on, and the Bashkirs dispersed for the night, promising to assemble the next morning at daybreak and ride out before sunrise to the appointed spot. Paham lay on the feather bed but could not sleep. He kept thinking about the land. What a large tract I will mark off, thought he. I can easily go 35 miles in a day. The days are long now, and within a circuit of 35 miles, what a lot of land there will be. I will sell the poorer land, or let it to peasants, but I'll pick out the best and farm it. I will buy two ox teams and hire two more laborers. About 150 acres shall be plow land, and I will pasture cattle on the rest. Paham lay awake all night and dozed off only just before dawn. Hardly were his eyes closed when he had a dream. He thought he was lying in that same tent, and heard somebody chuckling outside. He wondered who it could be, and rose and went out, and he saw the Bashkir chief sitting in front of the tent, holding his side and rolling about with laughter. Going nearer to the chief, Paham asked, 
What are you laughing at? But he saw that it was no longer the chief, but the dealer who had recently stopped at his house and had told him about the land. Just as Pahon was going to ask, Have you been here long? He saw that it was not the dealer, but the peasant who had come up from the Volga, long ago, to Pahom's old home. Then he saw that it was not the peasant either, but the devil himself, with hoofs and horns, sitting there and chuckling, and before him lay a man barefoot, prostrate on the ground, with only trousers and a shirt on. And Pahom dreamt that he looked more attentively to see what sort of man it was lying there. And he saw that the man was dead, and that it was himself. He awoke horror-struck. What things one does dream, thought he. Looking round, he saw through the open door that the dawn was breaking. It's time to wake them up, thought he. We ought to be starting. He got up, roused his man, who was sleeping in his cart, bade him harness, and went to call the Bashkirs. It's time to go to the steppe to measure the land, he said. The Bashkirs rose and assembled, and the chief came too. Then they began drinking kumis again, and offered Pahom some tea, but he would not wait. If we are to go, let us go. It is high time, said he. The Bashkirs got ready, and they all started, some mounted on horses and some in carts. Pahom drove in his own small cart with his servant, and took a spade with him. When they reached the steppe, the morning red was beginning to kindle. They ascended a hillock, called by the Bashkirs a shikan, and dismounting from their carts and their horses, gathered in one spot. The chief came up to Pahom and stretched out his arm towards the plain. See, said he, all this as far as your eye can reach is ours. You may have any part of it you like. Pahom's eyes glistened. It was all virgin soil, as flat as the palm of your hand, as black as the seed of a poppy. And in the hollows, different kinds of grasses grew breast high. The chief took off his fox fur cap, placed it on the ground, and said, this will be the mark. Start from here and return here again. All the land you go round shall be yours. Paham took out his money and put it on the cap. Then he took off his outer coat, remaining in his sleeveless undercoat. He unfastened his girdle and tied it right below his stomach, put a little bag of bread into the breast of his coat, and tying a flask of water to his girdle, he drew up the tops of his boots, took the spade from his man, and stood ready to start. He considered for some moments which way he had better go. It was tempting everywhere. No matter, he concluded. I will go towards the rising sun. He turned his face to the east, stretched himself, and waited for the sun to appear above the rim. I must lose no time, he thought, and it is easier walking while it is still cool. The sun's rays had hardly flashed above the horizon before Pahom, carrying the spade over his shoulder, went down into the steppe. Paham started walking neither slowly nor quickly. After having gone a thousand yards, he stopped, dug a hole, and placed pieces of turf one on another to make it more visible. Then he went on, and now that he had walked off his stiffness, he quickened his pace. After a while, he dug another hole. Paham looked back. The hillock could be distinctly seen in the sunlight with the people on it and the glistening tires of the cartwheels. At a rough guess, Paham concluded that he had walked three miles. It was growing warmer. He took off his undercoat, flung it across his shoulder, and went on again. It had grown quite warm now. He looked at the sun. It was time to think of breakfast. The first shift is done, but there are four in a day, and it is too soon yet to turn. But I will just take off my boots, said he to himself. He sat down, took off his boots, stuck them into his girdle, and went on. It was easy walking now. I will go on for another three miles, thought he, and then turn to the left. The spot is so fine that it would be a pity to lose it. The further one goes, the better the land seems. He went straight on for a while, and when he looked round, the hillock was scarcely visible and the people on it looked like black ants, and he could just see something glistening there in the sun. Ah, thought Paham, I have gone far enough in this direction. It is time to turn. Besides, I am in a regular sweat and very thirsty. He stopped, dug a large hole, and heaped up pieces of turf. Next, he untied his flask, had a drink, and then turned sharply to the left. He went on and on. The grass was high, and it was very hot. Paham began to grow tired. He looked at the sun and saw that it was noon. Well, he thought, I must have a rest. He sat down and ate some bread and drank some water, but he did not lie down, thinking that if he did, he might fall asleep. After sitting a little while, he went on again. At first, he walked easily. The food had strengthened him, but it had become terribly hot. 
and he felt sleepy. Still, he went on, thinking, an hour to suffer, a lifetime to live. He went a long way in this direction also, and was about to turn to the left again when he perceived a damp hollow. It would be a pity to leave that out, he thought. Flax would do well there. So he went on past the hollow, and dug a hole on the other side of it before he turned the corner. Paham looked towards the hillock. The heat made the air hazy. It seemed to be quivering, and through the haze the people on the hillock could scarcely be seen. Ah, thought Paham, I have made the sides too long. I must make this one shorter. And he went along the third side, stepping faster. He looked at the sun. It was nearly halfway to the horizon, and he had not yet done two miles of the third side of the square. He was still ten miles from the goal. No, he thought, though it will make my land lopsided, I must hurry back in a straight line now. I might go too far, and as it is I have a great deal of land. So Paham hurriedly dug a hole and turned straight towards the hillock. Paham went straight towards the hillock, but he now walked with difficulty. He was done up with the heat. His bare feet were cut and bruised, and his legs began to fail. He longed to rest, but it was impossible if he meant to get back before sunset. The sun waits for no man, and it was sinking lower and lower. Oh dear, he thought. If only I have not blundered trying for too much. What if I am too late? He looked towards the hillock and at the sun. He was still far from his goal, and the sun was already near the rim. Paham walked on and on. It was very hard walking, but he went quicker and quicker. He pressed on, but was still far from the place. He began running, threw away his coat, his boots, his flask, and his cap, and kept only the spade which he used as a support. What shall I do? He thought again. I have grasped too much and ruined the whole affair. I can't get there before the sun sets. And this fear made him still more breathless. Paham went on running. His soaked shirt and trousers stuck to him and his mouth was parched. His breast was working like a blacksmith's bellows. His heart was beating like a hammer and his legs were giving way as if they did not belong to him. Paham was seized with terror lest he should die of the strain. Though afraid of death, he could not stop. After having run all that way, they will call me a fool if I stop now, thought he. And he ran on and on, and drew near, and heard the Bashkirs yelling and shouting to him, and their cries inflamed his heart still more. He gathered his last strength and ran on. The sun was close to the rim, and cloaked in mist looked large and red as blood. Now, yes, now it was about to set. The sun was quite low, but he was also quite near his aim. Paham could already see the people on the hillock, waving their arms to hurry him up. He could see the fox fur cap on the ground, and the money on it, and the chief sitting on the ground holding his sides, and Paham remembered his dream. There is plenty of land, thought he, but will God let me live on it? I have lost my life, I have lost my life, I shall never reach that spot. Paham looked at the sun which had reached the earth. One side of it had already disappeared. With all his remaining strength, he rushed on, bending his body forward so that his legs could hardly follow fast enough to keep him from falling. Just as he reached the hillock, it suddenly grew dark. He looked up. The sun had already set. He gave a cry. All my labor has been in vain, thought he, and was about to stop. But he heard the Bashkirs still shouting, and remembered that though to him, from below, the sun seemed to have set, they on the hillock could still see it. He took a long breath and ran up the hillock. It was still light there. He reached the top and saw the cap. Before it sat the chief, laughing and holding his sides. Again, Paham remembered his dream, and he uttered a cry. His legs gave way beneath him. He fell forward and reached the cap with his hands. Ah, oh, what a fine fellow, exclaimed the chief. He has gained much land. Paham's servant came running up and tried to raise him, but he saw that blood was flowing from his mouth. Paham was dead. The Bashkirs clicked their tongues to show their pity. His servant picked up the spade and dug a grave long enough for Paham to lie in and buried him in it. Six feet from his head to his heels was all he needed. That was how much land does a man need? I just love how dark that story gets towards the end. If the coffee house of Sirat was about pride, then this story was about greed. And Tolstoy being a landowner and interacting with many other landowners must have known the kind of greed that can exist and propagate. Paham's story can almost be seen as a kind of parallel for modern civilization. The Bashkirs 
are described as being very carefree people. Though they live very simply on their land, they want for nothing. They are able to drink of raw milk and milk products and occasionally have the meat of their herd animals. And they travel in tents and are very content to live in that way. They are a very merry culture, a very giving culture. They are nonviolent. Paham's desire for all this land. I think Tolstoy is pretty clear in what he's trying to say in each of these three stories. I just love how straightforward he is as a writer. I mean, he pretty much just like tells it as it is. Paham was pretty much asking for it when he basically said, if I had plenty of land, I shouldn't fear the devil himself. Yeah, that's when you invite trouble in your life. I used to work as a shepherd. I really miss that life. Traveling with the animals... It's quite carefree because as a shepherd, your responsibilities are very clear. Take care of the animals, make sure they have food and water. That's pretty much it. Modern civilization is more like rooted to one place for convenience's sake. We decided that living in one place was a good idea. Living near waterways was a good idea. Getting more involved in trade was a good idea. And that's not to say that they are bad ideas per se, but they do breed certain traits such as pride and greed. And we, as human beings, are still coming into our full maturity. We have the full capacity for consciousness, but do we really use it? I don't know about you, but there are times when I catch myself being asleep to my nature, to doing things without really thinking about them, acting in ways that are against my own best interests, and in ways that don't make sense. But that's why I think we're called to something better. And I think that's part of what Tolstoy is trying to say, is that we don't have to be like... Paham. We don't have to be intolerant of others' beliefs. We can make things work out. In three questions, the answer the king needed was to focus on the now. What is he doing at that moment? Who is he speaking to? When is the right time? Who are the right people? What is the most important thing to do? All of these are things we have to continuously ask ourselves in order to truly live, to truly be in the moment, and to be with God. Your first priority is, are you doing good in the present moment? Are you being good and truthful and helpful in the present moment? The most necessary man is he with whom you are, for no man knows whether he will ever have dealings with anyone else. And the most important affair is to do him good, because for that purpose alone was man sent into this life. Again, this was also one of the primary concepts of what men live by which is that we are put here on earth to do God's will and to do right by our fellow people. And that really shouldn't be a very complicated thing at all. As for the coffee house of Surat, summarized very succinctly when the Chinese man says, The higher a man's conception of God, the better will he know him, and the better he knows God, the nearer will he draw to him, imitating his goodness, his mercy, and his love of man. Therefore, let him who sees the sun's whole light filling the world refrain from blaming or despising the superstitious man who in his own idol sees one ray of that same light. Let him not despise even the unbeliever who is blind and cannot see the sun at all. So therein is the question of ignorance. The world is filled with people who think that they know what's best and, how every, and want to tell everybody else what to say, what to think, how to live their lives. There are certain factions of people who will get angry or upset and who will think that you are intolerant if you don't if you don't abide by their beliefs or share them. There are even some people who will call you out if you say nothing about certain issues. It's all insanity. The minute that you start telling people that there's only one way to think, there's there's the right way and everything else is wrong, is when you close yourself off to the fullness of life. There's a bit of a hint of Taoism in what the Chinese man says here. Can any one temple compare with that which God himself has built to unite all men in one faith and one religion? All human temples are built on the model of this temple, which is God's own world. He's talking about the natural world here. Every temple has its fonts, its vaulted roof, its lamps, its pictures or sculptures, its inscriptions, its books of the law, its offerings, its altars, and its priests. But in what temple is there such a font as the ocean? Such a vault is that of the heavens, such lamps as the sun, moon, and stars, or any figures to be compared with living, loving, mutually helpful men. Where are there any records of God's goodness so easy to understand 
as the blessings which God has strewn abroad for man's happiness? Where is there any book of the law so clear to each man as that written in his heart? What sacrifices equal the self-denials which loving men and women make for each other? And what altar can be compared with the heart of a good man on which God himself accepts the sacrifice? This way of looking at the world is very, very different from the sort of modern, I would say, scientism view, which puts down people and says, hey, we are nothing but insignificant specks. We are just these like tiny little blips of life that exist on this dead rock floating through space that just so happened to birth life. It's a great cosmic put down of what we are and what we are is luminous beings, beings of consciousness. Every day I subscribe more and more to the view that consciousness is the ground of all being, not matter. Quantum physics has been there for almost 100 years now, and for some reason this is not taught in schools. I feel that it's the most comforting thing ever to think that consciousness, not matter, is essentially what is. Anything that seems like a solid object is really just a whole bunch of electrons moving very quickly, and what are those electrons? They're just, they're just patterns of energy just waves moving back and forth. We think that whatever we can see, hear, touch, taste, and feel is real. But what's more real than that which we are sensing is the faculty that we are using to sense it. Our interactions with others are real because of the potential that we have to bring others up, to bring them closer to God's light and to the truth. It's way too easy to lose faith. Sorry if I'm just rambling here. The topic of God and mysticism is one that I feel is a lifelong journey, and I am just beginning to wrap my head around it. If you like, please let me know if you would prefer more Tolstoy, more classics in general. I can do uh, Greek philosophers, poetry, classic works of the 18 and 1900s, and more. I was also planning on doing some either reviews or readings of the Wizard of Oz series, and I may get into some George MacDonald as well. His stories are pretty easy to read, and I really love them. George MacDonald, if you're not aware, was a forerunner of Tolkien and Lewis. He is the progenitor of modern fantasy literature. He wrote both children's stories and adult stories, and he has a vast literary catalog. Thank you so, so much for joining me today. And if you enjoyed this video, please give me a like, comment, and subscribe if you're not already subscribed to this channel. It would help me out a lot. I really do enjoy making this content. Please have a great summer. Stay awesome, stay safe, and take care of yourselves and your loved ones. See you next time.